uh, we wanted to introduce eBird a little bit because um, a lot of newer birders don't really know how effective eBird can be for your own uh, benefit and um, to encourage everybody that birds to use it because it's become a tremendously powerful tool for scientists and conservation biologists to track birds and help to inform decision making and publicity and all of that good stuff. So um, what I want to do tonight is just go through some of the main features and then we'll talk about a little bit later on, talk about data entry, how that works. And then um, Irene will be introduced later. We'll talk about the uh, lovely trails and birds around Thatcher Woods and Trailside Museum where on Saturday the 17th, the October big day, which has kind of inspired this whole thing for eBird, we will be hosting Audubon and uh, Forest Preserve co-hosting walks at Trailside for, um, to enter data into eBird. So eBird used to have a tagline, I think it's gone from their website, which said eBird will change the way you bird. And, that was really an interesting thing because it certainly has informed my birding a little bit. And one of the things is that a lot of us who have birded for a long time, we do a lot of listing. And I have my questions about how we list and what that means. And eBird really encourages you not to list, but to actually document, especially with counting numbers, which is important. I've got tons, I've got stacks of ancient checklists from when I started birding in the 1970s and 80s, in which I just went out and I ticked off the species off of a card, off of a list. And it doesn't say a thing else about what that meant. And that's really disappointing to me now that I did not take better notes to pay more attention to what was going on. And eBird, at least uh, when you eBird, you, you at least count, at least you have some notion of numbers. And you're very strongly encouraged to enter comments on each one of your listings and where it helps to put in anything about habitat um, and other things. And when you see the entry data entry, we'll, uh, you'll learn more about that. So at the moment then, what I'm going to do is try to share my screen here and I'll walk through some of the really cool things that eBird can do for you before we get into the data entry. So let's see if this works. And you should be seeing uh, the eBird home screen. Is that, uh, somebody give me a thumbs up. Is that working? Yes, okay. So when you open eBird, eBird.org, very simple, this is what you get. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about these buttons up here at the top, but uh, down here on learn more, there's an introduction to eBird, which I'm not going to play for you. You can do that yourselves at some point. So, um, I want to go next to um, the button up here, Explore, which is already on. Um, and this is a great way for anybody. You don't have to be signed. You, you will have to join eBird. You'll have to set up an account in order to enter your data. But anybody without an account can go to eBird.org and do, and do all of this exploration. So we'll do that without being signed in. And you can do it in a number of different ways. What I usually do, because I know where I want to go, is I'll go to explore hotspots right away. And there are a number of hotspots and I will enter Columbus Park, because that's one of my favorite places. And it'll show you all the Columbus parks that people have for eBird. And it'll go to the one in Chicago. And it will tell you uh, that uh, yesterday, Eric Gyllenhaal was over there and this is all the things that he, he found. So you can check up on your local patches and eventually you'll get down there and you'll find your own entries if you have anything that he hasn't seen. There's uh, my fox sparrow that he didn't see that I saw the other day. And you can go from there, you can go to the Oh, we got this screen on the side. Get that out of the way. Go back to the hotspot map. And each one of these 
little buttons here, marks, is a local hotspot in the area. So if you know the place that you want to go, that's a really good way to, to just get started and find all those places. You might want to do regions. And you can do regions by starting with, and it helps to know, um, like, the county that you want to be in. That's, a, a, to my, I've found to be the easiest way to um, find your way. So I start by Cook. You go Cook, Illinois, United States. And this is going to tell you that we were just in our chat room talking about Pine Siskins. And here's Pine Siskins as one of the most recent things seen. Uh, somebody saw a great horned owl in Evanston and uh, so forth and so on down. And you can find all of the Cook County sightings that have been there. And you can go to the species. You can go to checklists. And you can find the eBirders that are there, recent visits. So we have a whole bunch of uh, visits that happen today. So you can go in here and you can go to any one of these. If you want to see what Kyle was finding in Lincoln Park today, you can go there and there's his list. So let's go back to the Explore screen. Bar charts I found to be really, really useful. You can get bar charts are uh, frequency sightings for every species that's been seen in a particular location. So we're going to go to Illinois. We're going to go to counties in Illinois. And we'll go to Cook. And this will bring up all of the birds that have been entered in eBird in Cook County with this uh, frequency band. So a black-bellied uh, whistling duck, very unusual, very few sightings. Old whistling duck looks like maybe there's one sighting, maybe two. So you get on down to things like snow geese, which show up every once in a while, Ross's geese. And Canada geese, which are here a lot all year long. So this, the thickness of the bar tells you how frequently they're sighted relative to the other things. So you can scroll down through all of these things. And since I just saw a flock of siskins, and I thought that was really cool, I'm going to scroll all the way down here to this whole long list. And there we go. We've got Pine siskin, and pine siskins are seen fairly commonly through most of the year, but not in the summer here. So you can see here, so my pine siskin sighting was pretty cool, but not rare. So if you have questions about any of these things, one of the um, things that you can find on eBird very quickly is um, this eBird Essentials is a um, course that you can take that there's um, an eBird Academy, a, a bird academy that Cornell University, who sponsors this whole eBird thing, has a number of courses that you can take. They charge a relatively minimal fee, but this one, the eBird Essentials, is free. And you can learn all this stuff that I'm telling you and, and much more by just checking that out. Um, so um, another advantage of exploring regions is if you are traveling, uh, say I want to go to visit my relatives in San Bernardino County, California. I can go here and I can see all the things that have been reported there. And I can do the same thing for bar charts and I can do the same thing for hotspots. So it's a really great resource for traveling. And just uh, exploring on the bigger picture of everything. Exploring species, you can just check out what's going on with any particular species. Since I've been talking about pine siskins, we'll go check them out. 
and it'll give you a nice picture, it'll give you some information, it'll give you a range map which you can zoom in on. And these little purple squares, the way the range map works is these are spots where the species has been recorded on eBird and the color, the darker the color, the more frequently they have been seen. And you can see here that in eBird there are 1,400,000 plus entries for the, uh, pine siskins around the world. You can visit a weekly bar chart and a bunch of other stuff like that. I'm not going to go into the science tab very much. There's a lot of really interesting things here that's a little bit more uh, in-depth and mainly for researchers, but you can learn some things there. I want to go, before I turn this over to Jen for data entry, I want to go over here to the news tab though and show you a couple things you can find here that are really cool. One, you can read more about the October Big Day, which again we're making a plug for here to get as many people out joining this process as you can. I don't know how to find this birdcast without going to the news. There must be a way to do it, but this is the way I have found it. This is really cool. This is the, uh, a, an actual live radar uh, summary of bird observations by radar. And you can, um, Go down here and get the live map. And play. And this will give you the last couple of hours of what's been found on the radar. And this is just the number of birds that are showing up on the radar screens. And you can go Let's slow this thing down a little bit. And there's the there's a forecast map, what's expected tonight. Looks like a good night for bird migration. Everybody get out there tomorrow. We've got very high numbers in the southeast. We've got medium numbers here in our area and much lower numbers around the other parts of the country. So these are really, really uh, useful and entertaining and you can spend, of course, hours and hours going through these things that are here and get links to all kinds of other stuff. I think, let's see, do I have something else on here I wanna do? Uh, there's a submissions map that's kind of entertaining as well. Well, I've lost the submissions map, but you can actually see in real time the uh, well, not here. Don't want to do that again. I'll look for the submissions map again. I lost track of it. Sometimes the site gets a little harder to navigate, uh, which actually just is a kind of a uh, quirky little thing is it's a map of the entire world and a little dot shows up when somebody enters a new observation into eBird and you can watch as dots pop up all over the world in real time and it counts the number of eBird submissions for the day. So um, let's go back to the uh, main screen here. And there's the eBird Essentials course. And um, from the main screen, there's that start and there'll be a place to create an account. And um, you can do that easily. It's easy to do. I won't uh, try to walk through it since I already have it. I will just go in there. Once you have your account, you can sign in and uh, do a submission. 
or you can go up here once you're signed in, you can go to my eBird and this will give you things like how many species you've observed, checklists, and you can monitor your own, edit your own data and your list through my eBird once you're signed in. So I'm going to get out of that and uh, turn this over. I think, uh, Judy, are you introducing Jen then? Yeah, thanks, John. <laughs> thanks so much. Okay, next we're gonna hear from Jen Johnson. So she's uh, uh, also a Chicago Audubon Society board member and she's a coordinator with the Wild Indigo program and she's gonna talk a little bit about data submission. Thank you, Judy, and thank you, John. So I'm gonna get my screen up so we can talk about data submission. So I'll admit, before I started using eBird, I was kind of intimidated by using it because I'm like, oh, all these scientists use data from eBird. But then I realized, well, it's really simple and it's really fun once you get used to it. So I'm going to just go step by step on how to uh, submit eBird and how the screens will look if you're using the app. And we'll also go over how to use um, putting your data if you're using the website. So once you've downloaded uh, eBird onto your phone or tablet, you'll open it and you'll see a screen much like this. And the cool thing about eBird is it will automatically put in the date and the time um, of where you're, of when you're birding if you're using the app. And if you have your uh, location services on or your GPS, it'll also load uh, where you're birding at automatically. And when you're ready and you see that all that information is correct, you can start your checklist. And your checklist will keep a time of how long you're um, birding. Um, and you can also simply type in the name of the bird. Um, if you're in the settings, you can use the scientific names or you can use the common names. So I use the common names just because it's easier. Um, either one, there's no right or wrong. So once you've found the bird species, you could tap those little gray plus signs and you're able to add how many. So if I'm looking at a ring-billed gull and I just see the one gull, I would just tap once. Or I would go to the next screen and I can just type in how, how many. Um, if I just clicked on the name of the bird. And under that, you can write the comments. You might say, well, that's a goal, but maybe it's juvenile, or maybe you found um, one that was nesting. So after you've completed your birding, you, you might be like, well, I'm done birding for the day. You would just go over how many, um, well, how many birds that you found, and you'd also see how long you were birding, and you can see how far you were walking or how large the area was that you were birding. And once you're com completed <laughs> with your birding, uh, you would just sub press submit. And you would have a total list of birds that you saw and you'd have how many at your hand. So this was from a prior event um, where I was out birding. And um, when I was done, I wanted to share my list and I was with Judy. Um, so once I was finished with my list, I would have gone to the bottom of the app where it says email, and I would just type in who I'm sending my eBird data to, and it would populate and I could just send it on to Judy, and I've done all of that from my phone. I could also use my eBird account to share my data, 
and that is on the same screen. You would type it, you would just press uh, ebird.org at the bottom of your app. And you can just type in who you're sending it to. So if it's another person with the eBird account or their email, you can write a quick message. Hey, this is from Birding Saturday at Whistler Woods. And you'd simply share your checklist. And if you found, oh, I took a quick note in my notebook. I didn't have my phone with me. Um, I'll just submit my data to eBird at home on my laptop. So once you've logged into your uh, to your eBird account, you would just select your uh, location, and it'll populate on the map, and you can of course adjust the county or the the coordinates, and then you would simply press continue. And from there on step two, you add your date and how are you observing your birds? Were you traveling? Were you stationary? Um, maybe you just were um, just enjoying your backyard or you were sitting in your car and you might have seen a bird. And I was like, oh, I should record this and you put in the time and how many people were with you. And similar to that list in the app, you'll receive uh, a list of birds to choose from. But instead of scrolling down the list, you can see on the right that you can just simply type in the type of bird. And for me, I saw a dark eyed jungle and I would press save. And when I was done, it was very similar to the app. I would press submit and my lists would be added into the eBird um, database. So the cool thing I found about the uh, data that I would enter is that it helps other scientists and it helps other birders. And eBird allows you to participate with a larger community of birders. Um, a lot of organizations use that information to continue their studies about climate change or looking for other ways to help birds and to help people. So I'm going to pass this on to John and then Irene. Okay, I just wanted to add a couple of things to what Jen um, put in about um, data entry. And if I share my screen again for a moment. When you, uh, when you go to submit, if you're on the website, you'll, you'll see this button up here amongst the, the top, the submit button. And I uh, wanted to point out that there are uh, some guidelines that eBird has about recording your time and distance. When you're on the phone out in the field, as Jen mentioned, which I don't do because I don't have that smartphone, it does it for you. But if you're taking notes, if you go to, uh, say, one of my sites is Beck Lake Forest Preserve, when you go to this screen that Jen showed you, uh, if you're traveling, they, you will put in the distance and the time yourself because, of course, you haven't got it recorded on your phone. And eBird likes to have, they have some guidelines about how to define that. It's very simple, but if you take that introductory course, I'll tell you that they, uh, if you say you walk out and back on one line, you only count the distance as, as the way, as one way. You don't count it both ways. I did not know that until I took their little course. So I had been entering erroneous distances in some of my walks. And as far as time goes, if you if you go to a different habitat, a very, very different habitat, they suggest you break it up into different observations, even if it's a continuous walk. But those are things that you can 
you can find uh, in those uh, in that course, which I highly recommend. So I will get out of that again. And then um, the other thing I wanted to point out before I forget is not only do we encourage you to participate Saturday for eBird's Big Day, we also have a Spring Big Day and then Audubon, Chicago, National Audubon sponsors the Christmas counts every winter. <clears throat> and the, uh, there are spring counts that are statewide that are coordinated by the Illinois Natural History Survey and Audubon and others. So really encourage you to get into that watching and observing, not just take checking off on the list. With that, I think we're ready for uh, Irene to give you some pretty pictures. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let's see. I'll go to share screen. Okay. And I'm, I'm assuming you can all see me and hear me. Not if yes, yes, okay. <laughs> okay, my name is Irene Flevy and I'm Assistant Director at Trailside Museum. And I am thrilled to share some photos of some of the birds that we ordinarily see at Trailside Museum and Thatcher Woods. So without any more ado, okay. So over here at uh, Trailside Museum, we offer bird walks and we generally pre-COVID times had at least one a month, sometimes two. Now, right now it's a little bit more nebulous simply because we are um, limiting the amount of participants in every walk. However, we are having um, a walk for the big day on uh, this coming uh, Saturday the 17th and we're limiting it to nine people. Um, and if you want to participate, you need to register at Trailside, but um, we welcome all levels of people and we will have binoculars available for you to uh, borrow if you don't have a good pair yourself. Now, as part of the big day, it's basically going for pretty much uh, 12 or 13 hours, basically sunrise to sunset. So you do not have to be with a group. You can do this on your own and enter your data on the big day. Okay, so walks at Trailside Museum usually are pretty fun. Uh, we walk through a variety of habitats and one of the things we often see are downy woodpeckers, uh, probably one of the most common critters that we see there. Uh, this particular uh, woodpecker is a male and you can tell because of the little red spot on its head and also you can tell it's a downy woodpecker because it's small and cute and has a relatively short bill. So other things that we have at Trailside, we have both a pond and we have the Des Plaines River. So we have quite a lot of water birds. We are very lucky. Most years we have black crowned night herons, um, just a wonderful penguin-like bird that hangs out at their ponds in the river and catches fish, tends to be um, pretty inactive during the day. So you have a good chance if you see one, it's gonna be sitting there all day if no one disturbs it. What we also have are wonderful great blue herons. Uh, we have a rookery of great blue herons nearby. Basically, that's a place where the herons raise their young. And so we tend to see great blue herons all year round, though much more commonly in spring, summer, and fall. They are a large and voracious bird. And you can see them down in our pond most every morning, catching fish and frogs. And I've even seen them catching chipmunks and drowning them in the pond. So they are, yeah, yeah, they're pretty, pretty cool birds, huh? <laughs> okay, um, other birds that we see, um, ducks, mallard ducks, uh, the, these pictures here, the mallard duck and the belted kingfisher, these are both pictures of female birds. Um, in many cases with birds, the females tend to be a little less showy but in the case of the belted kingfisher, the um, girl bird 
is the one who has the more distinctive belt on it where the male birds are much plainer. So this is a bird that we see pretty much from spring to fall at Trailside, particularly when it's not too busy. So early morning or late afternoon is a good time to see them. We always see Canada geese and uh, often have youngsters here. As long as the pond or river is uh, unfrozen, we tend to see them. Uh, they are year round residents, though we see less of them in the very cold parts of the winter. And we think our local ones probably go to the lakefront or someplace where the water is still open and does hang out there. Wood ducks. Wood ducks are a beautiful, beautiful creature. Uh, this is a picture of a male wood duck, very, um, just, just a wonderful thing to see. This particular duck actually nests up in trees. So you're just as likely to see them sitting in a tree as you are to see them swimming in the water. They tend to be a little bit um, scared of people. So generally when you see them, they're leaving but I was very lucky to get this particular shot. This one apparently was more used to people or who knows, I don't know, but it was great. Uh, woodland birds, and I'm gonna have a lot of uh, birds here that are migrants. So uh, Tennessee warblers is one of the very many beautiful warblers that move through our area in spring and fall. Um, this particular one, the Tennessee Warbler, uh, breeds uh, in the boreal forest for the most part, and they are insect eaters. And then they migrate back down to South America to spend the winter. And they are one of the birds that fly over the Gulf of Mexico. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. And interestingly, when they're uh, down in South America, one of the major places they hang out in is um, shade-grown coffee plantations. So if you drink shade-grown coffee, you are helping the Tennessee warbler. The other bird here is a golden-crowned kinglet. And this is a wonderful little bird that we're starting to see again. It also was very far north for the summer for breeding and now is moving through. And this particular bird, it's adorable. It's like a little fluffy ball of feathers that makes quick furtive movements in and out looking for insects and just a joy to see. Another bird that we see mostly in the springs, um, in summer too, in a fall, a rose-breasted grosbeak. This happens to be a male bird, very distinctly colored. That large uh, bill that it has is very good for uh, breaking nuts and seeds and things like that. The gray catbird, an acute little bird, uh, scurries a lot. So when you see a gray catbird, it usually is running across the ground and you're like, what is that? That's not a squirrel, that's not a chipmunk. No, it's a bird. That's a gray catbird. And they nest in shrubbery. And so if you're in, in our area, so if you're very lucky, you may see um, gray catbird feeding its young and the little ones scuttling around in the underbrush. A lot of fun to find. A beautiful bird that uh, moves around in our area is a common yellow throat. This happens to be a male, very distinctively colored. And another distinctively colored bird is the black cap chickadee. And the black cap chickadee stays in our area all year round. So you'll see the spring, summer, and fall. And winter, okay. <laughs> Birds at trail size feeders and gardens. Um, the downy woodpecker uh, and Baltimore Oriole, they are frequent uh, visitors. The Baltimore Oriole is a bird that will migrate, but the downy woodpecker will stay. And the house wren is another fun little bird. And this particular bird um, comes and is probably one of the easiest birds to attract to your yard if you have nesting boxes. So even a city backyard, if you have 
native plants and a lot of shrubs and trees, you may be able to attract a house wren, uh, male and female, and they can raise some babies in your yard. They eat um, insects, particularly soft body things like caterpillars. And so the more native plants you have in the yard, the more likely you are to be able to support them. All right. And then here are some favorites that most everybody knows, the American goldfinch and the northern cardinal. The American goldfinch is kind of an interesting bird in that it is probably one of the few birds that is a strict vegetarian. Even uh, when it's raising its young, it does not feed them insects. Most other birds of that size uh, will feed their babies insects because they're full of protein. This one only feeds their babies seeds. Northern Cardinal, um, another beautiful bird, instantly recognizable like robins and cardinals are probably the two birds that all children know. Um, these are both male birds. They're the uh, most colorful ones. A ruby-throated hummingbird, a bird that is here in spring, summer, and fall. This is a male, and most people know that they uh, sip nectar, but most people also don't know that they also eat insects. So the nectar is sort of like, uh, for a human, be the equivalent of slugging a, a Coke, and the insects they eat is like the main meal. That's the dinner that keeps them going. Uh, the dark-eyed junco, or sometimes called slate-colored junco, depending on which book you're reading, is a wonderful little bird that basically lives in um, the Arctic during the summer, and it comes down to stay in our area in the winter because our winters are so lovely, okay? Mild and balmy, all right? So right now, this is an interesting time of year because you should be able, if you're lucky, to see both ruby, the last ruby-throated thro hummingbirds migrating through and visiting the flowers, and you should be able to see the dark-eyed juncos moving in for the winter. So it's a double whammy, two different migrants going, uh, both going uh, south, but deciding to stay in different places. And finally, birds of prey. At Tarotside Museum, it's very easy to see red-tailed hawks. We have several pairs in the area. And then also Cooper's hawks, which are getting to be more and more prevalent in the area. So it's just something that if you go there with an open mind and a pair of binoculars and a bit of time, you will see a lot. Okay. So I think what we're going to do in here is we're probably going to go and start answering some of the questions. And if you have questions, please uh, put them on the chat and uh, we will endeavor to answer. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Irene. Uh, that was wonderful. And uh, there are a lot of comments uh, that people really enjoyed it. Uh, so now uh, Audubon's Program and Communications Manager is going to... Um, any questions? That's Antonio Flores. Hi, all. I'm Antonio Flores. Um, yeah, I just want to say again, like Judy said, all the compliments and the beautiful pictures and the presentations. This is really cool, really informative, really enjoyable. It's like hard to hit that trifecta, and y'all are killing it. Um, so this question is, oh, no, first I want to say something that John Elliott put in the chat box, that everyone who enters five checklists onto eBird for the 17th, will be entered into a drawing for some Zeiss binoculars. How cool is that? Um, so our first question comes from Gail Gold, and they're asking, what time is the Thatcher Woods event on Saturday? Okay, that's at 7.30 a.m. If you want to join, um, you need to call Trailside Museum to register, and I will make sure I put on the chat our address and our phone number so that people can call. And I'll do that right now. Um, we're, like I said, we are limiting it to about nine people because of the COVID thing. However, you are always welcome to come and walk in the forest preserves. The forest preserves are open from sunrise to sunset. And so it's cool. 
And I might add that Thatcher Woods is a designated hotspot. There are lots of entries there, so you can just go there and enter your own eBird list anytime you want for Thatcher and also GAR Jefferson and other forest preserves in the area. Thanks, y'all. Uh, next question from Lisa DeVito. Where do you find the app? Uh, where can you get eBird? Uh, this particular person has an Android device that they're asking about. And then kind of a uh, follow-up question to that is that they also have an account that they access and use through a laptop. How can they connect both accounts so that the account she's entering into the device communicates and reflects the information that is entered into the laptop? I can answer that one. Um, so if you're using an Android device, you can go use the, um, I, I think it's Google Play Store. Um, you can use and you can um, type in eBird and it'll populate and you can download it onto your phone. Um, if you're using an Apple device, you can use the Apple uh, store and use the app and the app is free. Um, if you have an account already that you created uh, on the laptop, you can um, sign in use your sign-in information on the app. So it'll be the same no matter where you are. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, from Deborah Perry, some entries when they're entering say confirmed and some say unconfirmed. What does that even mean? The um, eBird uh, has a panel of people who monitor entries and if you have something that's out of the ordinary, unusual, then it may show up as unconfirmed and a monitor will contact you possibly to get more information to see uh, and ask you, well, to confirm basically how uh, you observed this and identified it. This has happened uh, to me three, four times where things that I put in, they say, hmm, I'm not so sure about that and they'll contact you and ask for verification and more information. And um, if you all are entering something, uh, when, when you see that list that Jen showed you that comes up with all the birds that you can check off, if you see a bird or you think you see a bird that's not on that list, there'll be a button off on the side that says show rarities and it'll show the entire list of North American birds and you can find what you think you saw and you put it in. And I will guarantee you that if you enter that, that you will be contacted by an eBird uh, monitor to ask you to confirm that in some way or another. And uh, I just got one thrown out just the other day because I had a picture and, and the eBird monitor uh, said, no, I don't think your idea is right. And I agree with it. So, so you can, that's what unconfirmed is. Um, John, going back to you, uh, this is about the bird cast. What factors make you think that the next morning is going to be a good day for birding? I think that what they do is they just look at weather patterns. They look at what the radar has been showing, look at the weather forecasts about wind directions primarily, but other weather factors and make that prediction based on, uh, it's tied very closely to weather radar. It's the weather radar is what they use. To, to put that up. That's all I know about it. <laughs> cool. Um, totally unrelated, but it seems like um, there's a little bit of connections and networking. You can share lists and stuff. Can you have friends on eBird? I don't think so, not friends specifically. You just have to use, as Jen showed you, the, the share your list with people that you know. Um, Earlier in the breakout chat rooms, um, somebody had said that they had seen or heard that someone had seen a cerulean warbler and they hadn't seen it. Is there a way on eBird to find certain target birds that you might want to see? Yeah, you can go to that explore species and um, there's a bunch of links down there through that to find different things about a species. And I don't remember exactly how to tell you to do that, but it's in there. It's uh, 
I think especially if you have an account, you can go to My eBird and you can put in your own target species, what you wish to see, and it'll help you find them. Awesome. And I'd like to close out with my two favorite questions about eBird. One, how much does it cost? And two, what happens if you make a mistake entering data? Cost, nothing. It's, um, they, uh, Cornell sponsors it to get the data for their researchers to use. Uh, if you make a mistake, you can go back on my eBird and correct it yourself by uh, editing your checklist. There's a tab on there on my eBird to find all your checklists. You can open one up and edit it. Was that the answer? Uh, did that fully answer that? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't going to be like some special eBird SWAT breaking in and like yelling at me for making mistakes. <laughs> so if, 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 you, if you just make a mistake on common birds, nobody will flag it because there'd be no question asked about it. So it'd be up to you to find it. If it's something uncommon, your, 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 uh, your entry raises a flag about question, they will contact you, but they will do it very, very politely. <laughs> There's no... Nobody is, is going to, uh, to, to shame you or anything like that. So, Thank you all so much. I think so another new question came up there just at the end. Yeah, um, Deborah Perry is wondering, what if you're pretty sure but not positive on the species? Should you add it to the checklist or not? That's a judgment call of your own, I think. I know Jen can add uh, what she thinks about that as well. Uh, maybe Jen checked out. I guess she had to go. Oh, no, there she is. She's still there. <laughs> um, but... Um, there are places to put in on the checklist for um, unidentified birds. There are, uh, there's a place for warbler species, if you don't know for sure which one it is. There's a place for sparrow species, blackbird species. So if you're not sure, if you know you're in the right ballpark, put it there with a comment. Add to the comment what, you, if you think, well, I think maybe it was this because blah, 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 I saw that, but I'm not sure. And then there's a place there for just a totally a checkbox for how many just totally unidentified birds you saw. <laughs> okay, great. Well, this was a really wonderful program. I really want to thank all of our presenters, um, John Elliott, Jen Johnson, Irene Flebby, and then Antonio Flores for doing the questions. Um, and I would like to uh, invite people to become members of Chicago Audubon. If you're not this month, we've got a special um, matching gift where uh, we, you know, we can match up to $2,000 of, um, of membership uh, donations. So we would love to have you join us if you're not a member. Um, and then I just really want to really want to thank you. Um, thank you for, for coming and thank all of the presenters. This was terrific. So we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.